Yeah, book by book. Here we are once again at the Quinter Christian Centre in Shropshire, England, for the book of Proverbs and our study number two. Paul Blackham is joining me here, but our special guest is George Verwa, who's come from, well, really from around the world, in fact, to be with us on this occasion. It's great to see you again, George. Great. I actually live in London. In fact, I've been in Britain now 52 years, so yes. I'm still working on the language. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Well, friends, here we are in Proverbs number two. We're looking at chapters four to six. So, in a way, just as Jesus Christ is kind of personified wisdom with passion. So our key truth today is that we must love him to crucify our deceitful passions because in a real way, Christ is personified in the Proverbs here. I'm going to read uh, from chapter 4 here, verse 18, I think. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. Or in verse 6 earlier in the chapter, Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. So, remembering that Christ, we can ourselves say today, is the power and the wisdom of God. That's a quote, really, from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. Then why is wisdom presented here as a woman through our Proverbs? Speak to us, O theologian. <laughs> yeah, that's a common question, Viva, because if wisdom is Christ, and we think, um, what, how do we know that? Well, I often say to people, make a list of everything that is true of wisdom in these chapters. That in, if you get wisdom, you get life. If you get wisdom, you get the favor of the Lord. You get understanding. You get forgiveness. You, get, you know how to live. Everything that you will list is true of Christ. And then and all the way down through church history, people have understood this as Christ. And um, even when we say the Nicene Creed and at the Council of Nicaea back in the fourth century, that was came out of an understanding of the book of Proverbs as Christ, as wisdom and all that. But why is a woman? Because you think shouldn't was. Well, first of all, it's important to remember that the word, the Hebrew word for spirit is feminine and it's Christ filled with the spirit, the spirit of wisdom. And sometimes we think about the church as well as, as, as this woman in throughout scripture filled with the spirit. And I love it in the New Testament when the, Jesus says that if we ask for the spirit, the father will give us that, give us the spirit. Mm -hmm. And James says, if we ask for wisdom, we'll always receive that promise. So it's just to be filled with the spirit and to be filled with wisdom. It's the same thing. So that when we're looking at the book of Proverbs, it's not just God, the son in the abstract. It's God, the Son, the Lord Jesus, filled with the Spirit, the, fi the Spirit-filled man who lives human life as it was always supposed to be lived. I always think if the book of Proverbs was like a, a preacher and preaching wisdom, when the book of Proverbs looks at Jesus of Nazareth living human life as it's supposed to be, Proverbs would go, that's what I'm talking about. He's it. He's everything I ever dreamed of. That's wonderful to hear. It's a great testimony, too, for many people around the world who say, in the end, we read about the, from the Bible, and actually, so much of Proverbs is quoted by in the New Testament. Yes. That is a surefire indication that this indeed is part of the inspired, inerrant Word of God. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, we're in chapters 4 to 6. Looking at chapter 4, 23, that warns us to guard our heart, for it is the wellspring of life. I could ask, how does this chapter show the importance of this? As the wicked so often become addicted to evil, as in chapter, as in verse 6, you know, they, they cannot sleep till they do evil. What do you think about that, George? Well, we're getting into, for me, the most important part of the book of Proverbs, where it gets right into this issue of, of lust and sexual purity and this is why it was so important to me I had such struggle with lust I'd started into the world of pornography I wasn't from a Christian home and uh, here I'm a young Christian and some Christian I met gave me the idea I couldn't like kiss girls anymore I'm the main thing I did was kiss girls you know in those days we didn't jump in bed we just kissed up a storm so I needed a verse that was you know thou shall not kiss and I didn't find it so I kept kissing everything Available, But as I got into this Proverbs, I realized that this lust could have, 
you know, as it grew, it would, it would destroy me. And this brought me into brokenness and repentance. And all my life is also, as I've been counseling people with sexual addiction, almost all my Christian life, this has really helped me. There's, there's over 500 verses about sex in the Bible. But back in my day, it was hardly spoken about in the church. And then we wonder why there were so many casualties, including many Christian leaders. And just a few months ago, another major leader in America just had to stand up in front of his huge church and confess multiple adultery and addiction to pornography. So we're in something really relevant here. And I thank the Lord for that. And it's that way of the guarding of the heart. I love the verse, guard our heart, for it's the wellspring of life. So is it to say, if you allow whatever lust or greed or anger to go down into your heart and you don't guard that, that you can't do that with impunity. You do that, you allow it in, and that's going to create huge consequences for life. And people think, oh, it's okay, I, I've got it under control. No, no, once something's down in your heart, it's going to shape your whole life. Wow. Tremendous verse. Well, you see, it began with that verse uh, 18 of chapter 4, about the ever brighter path of the righteous. Oh, yeah. But that's, of course compared with this adulterous uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. So why in chapter 5, verse 20, do you see it there? It's yes. Captivation by an adulteress. Mm -hmm. why, why, why is it given such attraction, uh, such attention here yes. in the Proverbs? Why, oh, this why are these things mentioned in the Bible? <laughs> yeah, why are they mentioned it's in the Bible? It's quite offensive. It's quite offensive. Well, people sometimes say that. And when we used to at Speaker's Corner, read some of these things, people would say, that should, you shouldn't even mention things like that. But the point is, we were designed with great passion and affection. Why? Because we were designed to have like a passionate romance with the living God, the infinite being who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So he gave us massive appetites and passions and things. And the problem is, is when we direct those away from the living God to each other and expect of each other that level of satisfaction and fulfillment, it just doesn't happen. It just, it, you know, we, it, we sort of expect we, we, it, what the appetites that were meant to be satisfied with the infinite God for all eternity are turned on each other and we demand of each other a level that we can't give to each other. And so there's almost, it's almost, there's a pathetic failure in, in it when people say, oh, I found this relationship and it's everything and it's going to last forever. And then very quickly it fizzles out and there's disappointment and failure. But that's, and, and but the, I actually find the saddest thing of all is when a person like says, no, I'm totally satisfied in the, the human relationship I have. And I'm like, oh, that's so sad because we were designed for so much more. With so so the, the, all the way through here, we're being, the reason that this subject is addressed so often in Scripture and so deeply and frankly is because the Bible knows how we do, were designed. And we, unless we take this seriously and deal with it properly, it's going to control us in all sorts of ways. And if we go, well, I'm just going to repress it. I'm not going to face up to my desires. That's going to be like a volcano and you'll be crushed. You have to face it. It's a huge issue. Yeah. And look at chapter 5, verse, uh, tw verse 12. Yeah. You will say how I hated discipline. So sexual purity and celibacy, I mean, they're openly mocked really today. And I was, as you were saying, uh, George, a moment ago, even within the church sometimes we've lost sight of that wisdom. So what wisdom has Proverbs for those who feel... We could say trapped by such things. I, I just really feel we need to just read these couple of verses. There's mm. such dynamite, uh, you know, right there uh, in chapter 6. Just pick it up quickly at verse 23. For this command is a lamp, this teaching is a light, and correction and instruction, keeping you from your neighbor's wife. You know, it's not vague, is it? Mm. From the smooth talk of a wayward woman. We think of the whole massive growth of the, the prostitute industry and sex trafficking, which finally people are talking about. Proverbs had it before these things were even hardly thought about. Do not lust in your heart. Think of the battle with pornography today, much tougher than anything I faced as a young person. And we need to be able to help young people, of course, with a message of grace when they fail, when they, they put themselves down, especially if they're people who love Jesus. Do not lust in your heart after a beauty. Let her captivate you with her eyes. And that can be a picture, not necessarily a woman on the street corner. For a prostitute can be had for a loaf of bread, now completely 
free of charge through pornography? Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. Powerful stuff that, that we, need, we need to look at. And we encourage those who are with us in this program to read, to read every verse in this text. And read it maybe also in the message uh, paraphrase, which some of the verses just punch even harder. Yeah. We're on to something actually very, very serious indeed. And actually from the paths of the, right, of the righteous and the immoral, from those two different paths, now Proverbs actually introduces us also to what is called the sluggard. <laughs> it pops up several times, actually. We're looking at chapter 6, verses, let's see, 6 to 9, I think we'd say. Those, those particular verses in chapter 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer, gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? So that's a question for us now. From the beginning of the world, it seems, we were commanded to work, you know, for six days. So we could ask, why is it foolish when we forget that basic wisdom? Well, it is a, it is a tremendous foolishness because lots of people have a tremendous amount of leisure time and can just waste hours and hours and huge amounts of their life and then they feel depressed and tired. And the amazing thing is, is that when, a, when we are, like, tiredness doesn't create laziness. Laziness creates tiredness. It's that when we stop doing and stop working, then we become all tired. Oh, I can't be bothered. I may as well go back to bed and things like that. And it, people become depressed and the scriptures actually say that when we f fail to work properly, we get depressed and we can't understand what life's about and we lose our energy. It's because we were, God created us before the fall. He says, look, I want you to work for six days and then have a day where you're properly refreshed by me. The, 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 the Sabbath isn't just like a day for saying, oh, I'll do a bit of DIY or go down the park or something or just watch telly. That's not refreshing. I often feel more tired after spending two hours in front of the telly than if I'd done two hours doing something productive. Like, so the Lord's like, work for six days, but then spend a day being refreshed in me. And the, and the point is, whether we're unemployed or we're, or we're uh, working or looking after a home or we're retired or we're working in an office or a college, the point is we spend six Six days working for the glory of God. And, and the, the, the Proverbs return to this over and over again because the person who's the sluggard is not someone who's just ridiculously lazy all the time. It's just an ordinary person who time after time after time says, oh, well, I'll do it later or I'll get to it or it doesn't matter now. It's not a priority. And by cumulatively making those decisions not to work and, and be productive, you end up with nothing and your life's gone. And I guess it's not, it's not quite the same as being unemployed. Some are unemployed, yeah. but nevertheless are still like the ant. Exactly right. It doesn't matter who, whether we're paid for work, work or not. We may not be paid. But even if we haven't got paid employment, we can be busy and work and help others and serve the Lord and bring glory to him. Hmm. So we learn from these ants, um, apparently. Go to the ant, that's for chapter 6, verse 6. If we look at those verses again, what results from us, well, as you put it, lazing about? What do you think, George? Yeah. Well, again, these verses as a young Christian, they just kicked me all over the place. Uh, you know, I had a lazy streak. and I owned a business before I was a Christian. My dream was to be on the beach with my girlfriend and let other people work. I had 200 people part-time working for me. I had this red hot fire extinguisher. And so when I became a believer and I started to read many other verses in Proverbs on the same theme, we'll, we'll see them later on, it, you know, it just changed my life. And um, I've never had, since God met me here, much difficulty with, with laziness. It's just, um, and I was with a group of missionaries interviewing them. I lived in India and, and I never forget. I said, look, what's the biggest problem you guys are facing here in India to reach the lost? And almost 80% said it's laziness. So uh, we need to be honest and open and realize this, this, this might be happening in our lives right now. Those who are with us in this program, deal with it, repent of it, get, get some accountability so that you can, you can grow and be, be more productive for the kingdom. 
Wasting time, I think, is one of the greatest sins of our generation. Mm -hmm. So go to the ant, go to the ant, consider its ways and be wise. As we close off and be wise, you know, that's what you will need, actually. When we, Paul and I were working at All Souls Church in Langham Place in London, uh, we had on our team a lady called Sheena Gillis. You remember Sheena? Mm. We had her on our team because she was wise. She was our security against going down the wrong paths again and again. We learned from that. Join us again next time, won't you please? Thank you for joining us today.